But I want to um, get into how the the process of getting access to the uh, you know with the county with with USC County. Um, you would are you were already there. Um, Making, making, shooting this footage, but what what were the challenges in getting them to, to say yes? I mean, what what conditions did, did they place on you? Well, um, in many ways, the film was sort of a graduated project, um, and in first, you know, the first um, the first stop was, of course, convincing uh, Dr. Ed Newton, who's here tonight. Dr. Newton, you want to stand up for a second? Hello, thank you. Um, who I, you know, uh, I, I was a visiting medical student at the time. Now that's um, quite subhuman in medical hierarchy. Um, perhaps a, a documentarian's dream in that to be subhuman, to be invisible, and yet have just enough medical training to know where to put the lens was, was totally clutch. Um, he had the foresight to know that the space that was closing was so special and needed to be captured in a first class way. Um, he had uh, uh, the great faith in me to be able to pull it off. Um, and uh, it's really remarkable to me that he did that because uh, most department chairs I know would say, who the hell are you? You're a visiting medical student. I'm not even gonna meet with you. Well, he not only met with me, but then gave me the initial permission on sort of an archival basis, of course, that we would always get the uh, patient permissions. And then from there on, in sort of summary, um, I would say that the difficulties with the county were always sort of solved by convincing them that what we had to show the world was that in a post-Obamacare environment, this, why, why would you come to county? Well, you would come there because people cared. Uh, it was a non-money-making institution. Profit was not the goal. That is the difference between county and any other hospital that you would go to. And if we were to do that, if we were to show compassion, we had to do it in an authentic way. And to be authentic, you have to show the good and the bad. You have to show what works and what doesn't. And ultimately, I think that stuck. I mean, was there any difficulty in securing editorial control, artistic autonomy? I mean, because this is a, a, a filmmaker crowd, I'll, I'll, I'll say that probably the smartest thing that we, that we did in the whole process was to independently incorporate the film. So it was tempting uh, mm -hmm. from a funding standpoint to be a part of the university or perhaps to be a part of the county PR apparatus. Um, we resisted that and instead became uh, an LLC, as all films do. Uh, but in this case, it was... It was um, uh, particularly important because we uh, had a sort of an independent shell to us that was resistant to any sort of independent or, or, or internal reviews. Was there anything that was off limits that they said, no, I mean, you can't film here? Or did they, did they give you pretty much? Um, no, it was, a, it was the, the permission was unrestricted. I mean, I think that the general idea was that we had to keep the filming to the emergency department. I really think that the restrictions came to us internally as filmmakers. I think there were plenty of ethical scenarios where we said, you know, listen, this is a film that could not be shot at Cedar sinai This is a patient population that does not enjoy uh, the full benefits of privacy, perhaps a baseline. Uh, if you are homeless, you don't have privacy. It's something of your own life. And so what would it be to come to a hospital and suddenly have a cam in your face? Um, I think that that struck us as something internally that we were quite protective of and uh, sort of shot very delicately in that way when we could. There were a number of scenes of patients dying. And how did you present that to their respective loved ones? I mean, I mean just saying that we filmed your mother dying. Um, we want to, this is important for our film. Um, how did you present that to, they, to get their consent? Right. Well, in the particular case that you're referring to, there was a, a, a it wasn't a, a it wasn't an easy process. We we had initially let her know as she entered the ER that we were filming this. Did she have any initial objections? She said no. So we continued to film, uh, in, in a at times a non-identifying way. But I don't think that we felt like that was enough. Um, we found her uh, two months later. Um, showed her the footage, and we said, listen, you can opt out. Uh, we know you gave us sort of your verbal permission at the time. Um, as a physician first, as a filmmaker second, are you all right with this? Um, here's the mission of the film. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and at that point, she gave us um, her permission. I'm, I'm reminded, though, of a case. Uh, he's, he's in the first 30 minutes of the film in the old place. It was a, a sort of a, a gang member who had been stabbed in the chest. He has to have a chest tube put in, and we sort of record that. Uh, we found him a week later as an inpatient, and we said, listen, you were incapacitated at the time. We didn't feel it was right to consent you then. 
are you all right with this? And he said, well, let me see it. And he watched the footage of himself being resuscitated. And we probably could have made a short film just on some of these patients watching themselves be resuscitated because they didn't know what had happened wow. at the time. And it, it, obviously he gave us his permission, but his reaction to watching himself be worked on was quite extraordinary.